in the world championships. You're in a race and uh, uh, you're in fourth place and you're running hard and, and you overtake uh, uh, the runner, you get past the next runner and a final spurt uh, and you overtake the person in second place. Uh, what's your position now in the race? No. If you've overtaken the person in second place, you're in second place. That was a trick question. Ah, you got to think. Questions make you think. And there are three questions in our passage this morning that we read. Two questions that Jesus asks and a question uh, that his followers ask. And there are three questions because there are three interactions that Jesus has at the time of his arrest. Uh, he interacts with Judas. He interacts with his followers. He interacts with the crowd that come to arrest him. And interestingly, Luke uh, uh, makes a unique contribution to each of those encounters. He tells us something that neither Matthew, Mark or John tell us uh, in each of those encounters there on the Mount of Olives. So let's look at those uh, uh, questions. Uh, first of all, between Jesus and Judas. Uh, we're told, aren't we, verse 47 and 48, while Jesus was still speaking to his disciples, a crowd came up and the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss. Again, uh, Luke uh, introduces Judas as one of the twelve. That's to underline the fact that he was one of Jesus' close companions, one of Jesus' friends yeah. uh, there uh, in the garden. And again, that takes us back to Psalm 55, doesn't it? Verse 12. If an enemy were insulting me, I could endure it. If a foe were raising himself against me, I could hide from him. But it is you, a man like myself, my companion, my close friend, with whom I once enjoyed sweet fellowship as we walked with the throng at the house of God. My companion attacks his friends. He violates his covenant. His speech is as smooth as butter, yet war is in his heart. His words are more soothing than oil, Yet they are drawn swords. Judas, one of the twelve, leads the crowd coming to arrest Jesus. This crowd, as we know later in the passage, are armed with swords and clubs. And as uh, he, uh, he approached Jesus, he drew near to kiss him. That was the normal way uh, uh, to greet uh, a friend uh, in Bible uh, times and in some places around the world uh, today. Uh, we're a bit more reserved in Britain. We give a handshake or maybe a hug. Uh, but a uh, common way uh, uh, to greet someone was to kiss them. It's a demonstration of love uh, and affection. Remember earlier in Luke's Gospel, uh, a woman that Jesus had forgiven her sin in Luke chapter 12, kisses his feet uh, and washes them with her hair and uh, uh, dries them with her hair, I mean. And again, in Luke 15, uh, the father runs uh, and greets uh, the son that he thought was lost and has returned, and he kisses him. It's a sign of love and affection. And that's what Judas uh, goes to do. And so... Jesus question, and if we put it in the order it comes in originally, Judas, with a kiss, the son of man, are you betraying? The kiss goes first in the sentence to underline that this is totally incongruous. With a kiss, are you betraying the son of man? This is exposing Judas treacheries. If Jesus says, I know what you're about, Whatever you pretend with this gesture of friendship and affection, I know what you're about, uh, Judas. Jesus sees through all pretense. 
And Jesus sees through all our pretense. Jesus knows our heart. Jesus knows exactly what we're about. Whatever show we put on, Jesus sees through it to our hearts. They are open and exposed to him. And that's surely part of what's happening here. Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? But also, isn't it a final appeal to the conscience of Judas? This is the last word that Jesus speaks to him. He's given him warnings even earlier in the upper room. Woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Think what you're doing. Questions are to make us think. Judas, think what you're doing, man. One commentator says, yet was his last word to Judas tremendous enough to thunder through his ears to all eternity. An appeal to his conscience and Judas subdues it and hardens his conscience and goes ahead with his treacherous betrayal of Jesus. That searching question. Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? And a reminder that Jesus searches us and our hearts. He knows exactly what's going on inside. Whatever pretense we put on, whatever show we make, Jesus sees through it and sees our hearts. But then we have Jesus uh, interacting with his followers. When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? Servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. It's interesting, they didn't wait for an answer. Do we ever do that? Lord, help me with this, guide me with this. What is your will? But then we go ahead and do what we think is best. We ask the Lord a question. We should wait for his answer. Uh, they were a bit headstrong. Uh, they didn't uh, uh, wait. Uh, and sometimes we can go ahead uh, with our plan after perfunctory prayer, saying the right prayer, but going ahead with what we want to do. And it's interesting, all four Gospels record the infliction of this wound. That's an unusual thing that have all four Gospels record the infliction of this wound. It's John who tells us it was Peter who drew his sword. And I presume the servant must have swerved. I don't think Peter was that bad a shot. Did he swerve out the way? And off goes his, uh, it's his right ear that's uh, sliced off. This is a misunderstanding of something Jesus said in the upper room. Turn back in Luke uh, 22 and uh, verse 36. <clears throat> uh, Jesus had reminded them of their earlier mission. Verse 35, when I sent you without purse, bag or sandals, did you lack anything? Nothing, they said. He said to them, but now if you have a purse, take it and also a bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. It is written, he was numbered with the transgressors, and I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment. The disciples said, see, Lord, here are two swords. That is enough, he replied. So Jesus had told them that you'll need to buy a sword now. I think it's a misunderstanding of what Jesus was saying. Jesus was preparing them for the new phase of their mission. When he had sent them out previously, Jesus was popular. Uh, people loved Jesus. Crowds went around and, and they were given Jesus power to heal and deliver. Uh, uh, and so uh, they were received, uh, welcomed uh, and provided for. Well, Jesus said it's going to be different now. I'm not going to be popular. Jesus said it is written. He was numbered with the transgressors. People are going to think I'm lawless now. So they're not going to treat you well. 
Uh, you need to be prepared for a new phase uh, in uh, the mission. Uh, uh, things will be different now. Jesus is no longer popular. But I don't think Jesus meant it literally. I think he was just saying, using this manner of speech to say, you need to prepare for a new phase in your mission. Uh, I think they misunderstood him. And we'll, I'll, I'll explain why I think they've misunderstood him. Uh, uh, should we strike with our swords? You said about taking swords. We've got to shoot. Whoa, whack. And off comes the ear. Jesus answered. So here's the answer. <laughs> Jesus answered, no more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. And most of our modern versions translate uh, Jesus uh, answer in that way, no more of this. Literally, it's a bit more ambiguous. Uh, Jesus says, permit as far as this or permit until this. And that's a bit ambiguous. What does that mean? Permit until this, permit as far as this. And it's given commentators three answers to that question. What did Jesus mean? Some think it means permit this rash outburst by the disciples and let them go. Permit this rash act that they perform, let them go. Like linking with what happens in John 18, Jesus makes sure that the disciples are released uh, and not uh, uh, taken with him. So permit this rash act, uh, uh, let them go. Uh, some think it means uh, permit to, uh, until this healing of the ear. Don't tie up my hands until I've healed the, the servant. Uh, something, that's what it means. But I don't think Jesus is addressing the crowd. Jesus answered the question that the disciples had posed, and Jesus doesn't address the crowd until verse 52. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard, and the elders who had come for him. So Jesus is speaking to the disciples, and in essence, permit until this, permit them to take me. Allow them to take me. Don't resist. Don't fight back. Permit this to happen. That ties in, I think, with uh, what uh, Jesus says in uh, Matthew. Uh, Put your sword away. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. I could call 12 legions of angels. I don't need you wielding your swords. I could have 12 legions of angels to protect me. Let this happen. Permit this to be. And I think the healing, he touched the man's ear and healed him. And it's only Luke who tells us that. Uh, while well, Matthew, Mark and John all tell us that the ear was sliced off, only Luke tells us that the ear was healed. That reverses the act of violence. Healing the ear reverses the act of violence on the part of his disciples. It's a repudiation of that act of uh, violence. So I think that's comparable to uh, uh, in Matthew, put your sword away. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. In uh, John, put your sword away. Uh, I'll drink the cup the Father has given me. This is Jesus' way of repudiating what his followers had done. He heals the man and reverses that act of violence. That's not the way for Jesus' followers to act. I think we can draw contrast with Islam uh, that uh, was a, a, a conquering religion at the by the sword Christianity is not to be like that it's not a sword it's not a religion that uh, con uh, conquers by the sword it's a religion that conquers by the word at the word spoken and so his uh, followers uh, are uh, rebuked uh, and uh, uh, their question is answered uh, by Jesus healing uh, the man. And uh, again, we see something of the grace of the Lord Jesus here is the servant or the slave of the high priest. The slave, and it's only a surface wound, it's only his ear that he's lost. 
It's not life-threatening, but Jesus cares for him and heals the wound by his grace and power. Jesus and his followers. And then Jesus uh, and the crowd. Uh, Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard and the elders who had come for him, am I leading a rebellion that you have come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts and you did not lay a hand on me. Uh, am I leading a rebellion? Or well, more accurately, uh, as upon a brigand or bandit or pirate, that's how the word is used normally, uh, a robber, a, a pirate, a, a bandit. Is that who you've come to arrest with your swords and clubs? Who was actually acting the part of pirates and bandits? Those who had swords and clubs, not uh, Jesus. It was they who were playing the part of bandits and brigands. Uh, Jesus was not. He was a, it spent a week teaching in public there in Jerusalem every day. I was with you in the temple courts. But now it's night. And under cover of darkness, yet you are uh, performing your dastardly deed. And we're reminded of that uh, 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 earlier uh, in Luke, at the end of Luke 21. Uh, uh, it says in verse 37, Luke 21, each day Jesus was teaching at the temple and each evening he went out to, to spend the night on the Mount of Olives. Uh, and all the people came early in the morning to hear him at the temple. Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread called Passover was approaching. And the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for a, some way to get rid of Jesus. For they were afraid of the people. They couldn't do it in daylight because Jesus was so popular. Judas agrees. Uh, and we read in Luke 22 verse 6. He consented Judas and watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them when no crowd was present. And here's the opportunity. There's no crowd now. The, the throng is gone. Uh, it's night. Uh, and uh, uh, this mob comes to arrest uh, Jesus. Am I a pirate? Again, Jesus says, think about Think about what you're doing here. Think about who you've come to arrest with your swords and clubs. The teacher who was allowed there in the temple daily this past week to teach and preach. But, the end of verse 20, 53, but this is your hour when darkness reigns. Again, that's a, a, a phrase unique to Luke. In his account, this is your hour when darkness reigns. A set and restricted, it's an hour. that They've got their moment now. It's a set time, it's a restricted time in God's purpose and plan. This is your hour. That hour will come to an end when Jesus conquers them and rises back to life. It's your hour. When darkness reigns, the authority of darkness, the power of darkness. Yes, I think Jesus is reflecting on the fact that they're operating in darkness. That they've not done it during the day. Now at night, they come uh, as a mob. But that's also the darkness of evil power. Remember Paul, uh, when he's describing his mission in Acts 23, uh, verse 18 says, God has sent me to deliver people from uh, the power of darkness uh, and bring them into light from the power of Satan to God. To deliver people from darkness and bring them into light from the power of Satan to God. And that's the parallel, darkness and the power of Satan. Paul writing in Colossians says, for uh, he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of of the son he loves. He's rescued us from the dominion of darkness. That's the same word that's used uh, there in Luke 22. The dominion of darkness. 
And uh, again, in Ephesians, Paul explains uh, what that means. He says in Ephesians 5, verse 8, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And therefore, we can flip that over and think the fruit of darkness is badness, wrongness, and lies. And that's what's going to unfold now uh, in the moment, in the in, in the coming hours for Jesus. Badness, wrongness, and lies. Again, in Ephesians six, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. That's who Jesus must now do contest with, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And so we have these questions. Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Lord, should we strike with our swords? Am I leading a rebellion that you have come with swords and clubs? And we notice in each of these encounters, the poise of Jesus. When Judas comes, he doesn't, he doesn't hit out at Judas. He doesn't condemn him. He asked the question, Judas, you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss. When the disciples lose it, <laughs> Jesus doesn't lose it. No more of this. And he heals the man. When the crowd uh, come, really? A bandit? No, but this is your hour. When darkness reigns, Jesus doesn't lose it in this crisis moment. Because uh, as we read in Psalm 55, but as for me, I trust in you. He could be calm and collected because he knew that God was in control of Judas, of his foolish followers, of this mob that are out to get him. Jesus was in control as he gave himself willingly to be treated abominably in the hours ahead. This is our saviour and he's beautiful uh, as we see him depicted here uh, in Luke 22. We're going to sing of that in our closing hymn. All my days I will sing this song of gladness. Beautiful Saviour, our Saviour Jesus.